which we should have Bob Hopkins here because for me it was very much Bob who initiated the whole thing. <coughs> Neil, Neil would remember it better than me, I reckon. But my, my story is that it was a particularly bad year of helicopter raids. Bob lived on Paradise Valley, out, just not far out here. And the helicopter raids are full on, you know. It is, you know, you've seen those um, Vietnam War movies where hel helicopters, it's such a loud noise over your house animals and children going off, everyone pretty hysterical. So it was a May day, I think it was a Sunday or a Saturday, possibly. It was, yeah, it was a Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, 1st of May, traditional protest day, May day. So Bob says, right, we're gonna march on the, on the cop shop. And we hastily made this, sewed sheets together to make a joint over a bamboo kind of frame and people dressed up. Bob was in a nun's outfit with a big tuba or something. Was, anyway, my memory is a lot of people came and we had a hell of a good time and vowed then and there we're going to do this every year till the laws are changed. Well, it's 31 years later, so it's become exhausting. And yesterday, the, the local cop, this Mardi Gras, I don't know if some of you were there, was the quietest of police for 20 years, I thought. They weren't in town much. They did their roadblocks, but they went home at four in the afternoon. But yesterday, the local cop comes up to me and goes, Michael, I've been asked to tell you, ask you, and he was pretty firm about it, is that the last Mardi Gras? You know, people have had enough. So kind of, I don't know. I said, this is Aquarius, this is not Mardi Gras. Man. There'll be one next year. And he goes, oh, well, you know, he was clearly unimpressed. Anyway, Neil, what's your memory? So Neil, Neil would have been involved in every Mardi Gras right from the beginning, Neil Pike. Caroline joined, joined, came from, I met Caroline at Mardi Gras 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, she came as a volunteer. A lot of the people who work in the Hemp Embassy and volunteer have been busted. And it's a real wake-up call. She got busted. And it's a real wake-up call. She nearly went to jail. And quite a lot of people have come to the Hemp Embassy to help change the laws after after really having to, uh, their personal experience. And Chibo here, the Hemp Olympics runner, has been to every Mardi Gras. Yeah, I've been to every Mardi Gras for sure. I got uh, in the second year involved uh, more than just being there. And <clears throat> I remember that uh, before we did the Sunday 1st of May rally, uh, Bob was already putting out uh, papers to say that uh, when the helicopters come and before the ground troops enter your community, because the helicopter actually drops off some white plastic -y thing to show the easiest way to the plot, and so then the ground troops go in there and rip all the plants out, maybe five or maybe 50. And uh, so he said, you know, let's all wait for them and bring your uh, uh, garden tools like a medic and all these things. So there was a real call there in the build up. And I think that was the same year, wasn't it, when uh, people were chaining themselves under the police cars. Right. Well, historically, and maybe it's all a bit wishy-washy. But, uh, yeah, no, anyway, and some, some brave person uh, chained herself or himself, I'm not sure anymore, uh, to the helicopter, which was parked out here on the way to Lismore in a paddock, and they found the helicopter, and then after the first, second day or something of the raids, they locked on there. And uh, I remember Andy Putnam saying that... Uh, he was outside standing at the motel in Lismore and the cops were coming out after brekkie and getting ready to go and uh, do the groundwork and everything. And somebody had to point out to them, you might have to look under the car. I think you can't just drive off like this. And there were all these people under the car <laughs> locked on and uh, it was a bit of a shock to them and everything. So I think that was for me in some way as well, part of the beginning. First thing in the morning, according to Salty and various other people, they pretty well fitted people up with pot, which is criminal parlance where they just gave him the pot and said you're busted. Um, Salty reckons they offered him a choice of a cap of smack or a bag of pot and he went for the pot because um, it was less of a bust. Um, and they just piled everybody in a cattle truck, took them into Lismore, drove them around town to show all the locals what they'd achieved. 
and you know then they got released and there was a court case but they hadn't figured on the fact that <coughs> some of the hippies were pretty well connected and knew some good lawyers and they got a bloke called Dean Letcher who was a highfalutin lawyer to come up way better than the sort of country practitioners that the Lismore locals could organise and he got it all pretty well all thrown out of court I think that's correct meanwhile in Cedar Bay they went in there firing their guns at the coconut trees with help from the federal navy right and <laughs> unbelievable burnt the houses down cut down all the fruit trees chained the hippies to coconut trees and found maybe half a dozen seedlings you know um, and that never came to anything, even though it probably got more publicity, that nevertheless they got away with it because J.B. Elkie Peterson. That's all. I don't know if any of you younger folk know about that. He was, a, was pretty much a police state up there. Here we sort of had a Labor government. It was more a local council push, I suspect, or a local, a localised thing that was the problem. I, I could be wrong on that. Terry would know more about that than, than me. But to me, that, that really is... I mean, everyone smoked pot that was, a, that was in Nimmin at that stage or most people were friendly about it in terms of the, the, the freaks. Um, but that was the beginning of, like, here's, the, you know, the, 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 the jackboot of authority stamping down on our necks. Now, that sort of kept up for a good, you know, 20 years with helicopter raids, which were a regular part of the thing, police raids... And it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel, you know. You come in, oh, let's let's go bust the hippies, and it's it's all it became almost a tradition with the local cops, and there was very definitely a hippie hate, you know, us versus th them thing running, which is pretty traditional. Terrania, the blockade at Terrania, didn't help with that. That really added to the problem, though. Though it, it was, I, I was there, and I think it was a great thing, and I'm proud of having been there. But there was definitely a hippies versus rednecks thing running for a long time, and the cops were the arm of the rednecks. Now. That's changed a bit lately because the young young guys don't really give a fuck about that. With us hippies, are just <laughs> you want you know we're worried about this. we're worried about ice heads, guys. You know, like pot smoking hippies, mate. They're old, you know, and the young ones are harmless. They they all know someone that smokes pot. A lot of them smoke pot themselves. So it is changing on that level. Cut to ninety three was the first big Mardi Gras, but the year before Bob, who's has disowned the whole movement now but at the time he was very you know a real backbone of it and I was living with his daughter at the time so I'd see him quite a lot and he'd, he'd go down he'd spend an afternoon with Michael plotting and scheming and planning the revolution then he'd come up to my place and continue the plot and so he, he was you know bouncing backwards and forwards between the two of us the year before 93 and 92 on May Day and Luke Hopkins has been busily pointing this out on Facebook Bob did a single march down down Cullen Street in his first stage plantum costume with a bass drum trying to drum up support because most of us had at that point gone fuck just keep your head down dude you don't 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 bring them back don't bring them back don't wave at them they'll come you know um but bob god love him just did this single-handed thing and he forced his two sons to march along with him and i, I videoed that i think there's some video of it on the net somewhere um but then the following year he talked it up even further and well planned it with michael to do this rally parade thing and yeah a thousand people turned up for that because we did advertising for it and shit and it was a wonderful fantastic experience the big joint the first big joint was built and it had smoke coming out of it it was a real classic old school hippie pr project and um and it was okay we take it down to the police station and they all marched into the cop shop with this thing and there's footage of that as well um there was not a cop to be seen they're all in lisbon <laughs> i'm fucking not going out there and I think that was pretty empowering for a lot of people. And and, and then there was a, a, a thing in the hall and you smoke, spoke and David Halpin, who was just a, a, a lawyer. I mean, this is ex-magistrate David Halpin now. At that point, he was the lawyer for um, <laughs> the Amp Embassy and the lawyer for um, NIFA. So he was, had one foot in either camp of the kind of the more radical political things going on around the area. He spoke. Bob hurled a whole lot of joints out into the audience. It was, a, and it was just a massive bongo frenzy. It was, it was cool. It was very cool. And each year it kept getting bigger. And I think it was the third or fourth year when the NIFA, the North East Forest Alliance, got involved. Because, I mean, yeah, Bob and all of us have been trying to talk up blockades with the helicopter raids for a long time. But pff, you try and organise, it's like herding cats, you know? Particularly when it comes to putting yourself on the front line against a state authority who's got a gun on his hip. People talk about sovereignty. Let me tell you, sovereignty comes out of the barrel of a gun, you know. That, that's, they've got the gun, they've got the prison cells. You, you know, you're a free citizen, sure. 
Try and tell that to a cop. They just whack you on the head and lock you up. That's the reality of sovereignty, I'm afraid. Um, but the NEFA crew had a long history of blockading and stirring the Northeast Forest Alliance. They've been doing blockades in Shalundi, Ulamba, the whole range of places. Um, they got a line, because Ashley, who lived up the hill, he's dead now, he's Sue Higgins, the father of Sue Higginson's kids. Um, he, pretty staunch character, and he organised the NEFA crew to get involved, because they're all potheads, to get involved in, the, in doing a, a helicopter blockade. So, as Chibo told it very well, <laughs> in the morning, his gorgeous young girlfriend was chained to a fucking helicopter where it was parked, um, and <clears throat> in town where the cops were all stationed at the motel, there was a couple of NEFA lads locked onto their vehicles, and it was just... And the press... So they, they knew how to do it. You, you organise the blockade, then you call the press. And then it's on the front page, and then it's a story, and then they just shake their heads and go home. And they didn't actually come back for a couple of years after that. But meanwhile, Mardi Gras was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was fucking amazing, and it's wonderful, and I should give the mic back because I'll just dominate the bloody... Now, that's, that's, all, that's all good memories for me. There, there's, a, there's a couple of things there that are interesting. Bob... To, to show just how much Bob was into it, he changed his name by deed poll to Prohibition End. And then running in the elections, it read on the poll, End Prohibition, you know, how they put... Which was... Uh, you, could, you couldn't go much further. And the community got right behind him. We made cutouts of the plantum and had them at every polling booth where we couldn't have people there. And he got a huge vote, like 13% of some huge... It was a full-on National Party seat... Bill Rickson, I think I remember, was the local member, been embedded for years. Anyway, it was an, an extraordinary effort from Bob to kind of get the whole issue on the agenda. Can't give him enough credit for it. Anyway, Caroline, Caroline comes along. You came before the saliva testing? Yes. Like, like um, Neil was saying, Mardi Gras grew quickly. The word got out there, there's one cop in the town, you know. My favourite memory of early Mardi Gras is people would have a blanket on the street selling their little buds, you know, dollar fifty for this one, and you know, it was a bit really for no police. So quickly the word spread, and it was a big mistake in the Sydney Morning Herald. There was a story how the hemp bar had sold thirteen hundred joints on Saturday, and the next year all the cops came big time. So. Anyway, what's your memory? You ten years ago, there were no saliva testing. I think that changed everything. Yeah. So my first one was 2010. I just came as a punter, and I don't. Uh, there were cops here, definitely, but I don't remember the saliva testing then. And then 2011, I joined Jungle Patrol and did that for a couple of years because that's a pretty a great organisation that came. Did it come through Mardi Gras yeah, or was it? It's a plantum. <coughs> Of the plantum's outfit. Who wants to have a row no. about Jungle Patrol? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So, um, so that was really interesting. So the whole thing about that was help if asked and um, ask. Yeah, one of those. Ask yeah. For help. <laughs> yeah. Ask for help. yeah, ask for help. I'm not sure. Anyway, it was very good because it kind of rem put the police one step back from community relationships with policing or... Not that we're really policing community, but if people are in some kind of drama or danger, it's better for community to take care of it on the first stage before the police. And so Jungle Patrol totally represented that and that was a... I think it's a great little thing, you know, a, a great model for community. And then um, in 2013 I joined the... I came and worked at the Hemp Embassy as a volunteer there for Mardi Gras. And, um, and yeah, pretty quickly got involved in all of that. Um, but my origin story is I started smoking weed when I was 18 in 1981 and just loved it. It just changed my life. It just made everything so much easier for me to cope. And not much of a drinker and didn't really take any other drugs. I just love weed. And then I, I made it all the way through <coughs> tax paying and being a good girl until I was 45. And then I got busted growing some weed at home. And because it was Queensland... It was a, um, they wanted to, uh, I had five kilos of dried weed and some plants and uh, they wanted to put me away for 20 years. At 45, I'd never even been in a police station and before. So anyway, my experience was, was that I went to court and because I had a little bit of money, because we'd, you know, had a business and so on, so I could afford a lawyer, 
And the, the lawyer, actually the guy who arrested us, the arresting officer, when you go in and get processed, he gave me the business card of the barrister that I should contact as I left the police station. So I went home, I rang that barrister, he had a solicitor and they represented me. So if you can get that link up, that was a mind blow immediately for me. And then we went to court and he told me to you know, wear a suit, my husband to wear a suit and so on. So we went to court and, and in the waiting room, the next big blowout was that there were all these people who had no money. They were there with kids in prams. They've got, you know, they're not dressed in suits. No one's dressed in a suit. And they're there for a half a pill in their pocket. Or they took a piss outside a pub and they got picked up. Or they've got, a, you know, a drink driving. Just... Whatever it was, it was just minimal. You know, there was no... No one was injured. There was no victim. There was no anything like that. And we just swanned in past this waiting room and went into a private room because I had a suit on and we had a barrister and a solicitor. So that started a process of six months of going to court and trying to get it to Supreme Court because we started in magistrate. Magistrates can't help you. And we went to district and then we got to Supreme Court where an independent judge decided that because of my back injury that I've carried for a long time, which is why I love weed. It's so great for pain and I don't like any of the other painkillers. They just knock me out. And I, I got past it. So I got four years probation. So in that enlightened moment of not having to go to jail, I decided I had to come to Nimbin. And I'd always wanted to retire here. So it was just really an early retirement at 46. <laughs> And, uh, and came in and really just um, turned my life over to just really servicing community and people who actually needed some kind of help, however I could help. And, of course, I just think everyone should be able to take the drugs they really want to take. And, and you know, weed's just a plant. And all the plant medicines are beneficial in so many ways. And, you know, I just, I just think that if you, if you can't... If you're so overwhelmed by the fact that you these things are illegal and you're never allowed to take these medicines, then you can never get to a level where you can realise <coughs> what your truth is. And so for me, it just it just the, the court system, how we treat people, how people are made to be criminals and then they can't get jobs or they can't... Like, I couldn't go to America for 10 years. Not that I want to go to America, but I did want to go to South America, but I couldn't fly through America because I had this drug conviction. So then I have to take... You know, like, I don't know, eight different flights to get to the place because I just can't fly there. So, and that's me, I'm lucky I could fly, but so many people have got nothing and then, they, you know, the family's in jail or the house gets given up or the children are put into foster or... It's, it's just disgusting and it just, it just changed the whole way I thought about everything and uh, came here. Just on the point there, um, uh, Neil was making, you know, that the police didn't come after. There was a bit of action against the helicopter and the lock-ons and everything. Uh, I remember that the first two, three years, the police wasn't in town when we had Mardi Gras. They were hiding because we had this one issue. I think we were preparing the hall and somebody smoked a joint outside on the bench in front of the hall. The cops walked up and down, what they did a little bit from time to time, and they took him with him. And we just organized, I think we had 30, 50 people in the end, pelting with toilet paper and everything, the t uh, police station. So there was this whole fear there that if we are here for Mardi Gras and there's this drug taking riot squad or whatever and they're going to go and burn the whole, uh, police station down and the other thing with the jungle patrol there was this saying uh, uh, ask for help help if asked and I think that was Bob Hopkins again I remember the night before start of Mardi Gras probably 1996 that would be number three and we're down uh, the street there near the showground and uh, printing at uh, two o'clock in the morning, the t-shirts for the crew in the morning was that uh, beautiful, uh, I think it was a flying dove and a piece for pot, pot for peace and everything. And uh, yeah, so in some way the first years, police wasn't seen at Mardi Gras weekend at all. We had one day and then it grew into two, three days, the whole weekend then. And so they were not seen. And I think then in 96, 97, they came out with the shiny guys, the smiley guys. So they were just, you know, they, I think I'm not sure even if they had a weapon on them. I think they were just, you know, smiling and they were really good in communicating and being positive and whatever. But as Michael said, you know, I remember the scene in front of the rainbow 
one of our local musician women out there, and she had a whole suitcase, and we're talking of this size, suitcase full, and she had it open, and there were all these different packages in different size, and you know, she had it all on the, on the ground, out of the, out of the suitcase and everything. Every five, seven meters, there was a different jam session happening. It was just bliss. It was unbelievable. We had so much love and music in the streets there. There were the Japanese on uh, teaspoons and uh, one cup and knocking the shit out of them and just creating some rhythm. You know, it was just unbelievable. There was so much, you know, beautiful heart energy. And uh, yeah, in some way, the cops weren't there. Then they came a bit gently in and then they built up from there. And then we had the riot squads here for years and, and years and years. The black marshals driving up and down in their black marshal four-wheel drive cars and sitting there and ready to go and smash anybody. Like Dr. Andrew Catalaris standing and speaking up for an indigenous person who was uh, body searched in the street in front of the news agent and he, as he is, you know, had to get involved. Next thing he's on the ground and there's a fight going on and <laughs> unbelievable. So there was quite a bit of violence there from the police side, honestly. And uh, yeah, it was uh, really, you know, the early years of Mardi Gras and then it grew, as you said, you know, it grew so fast. And people, I was talking to some guy doing the Hemp Olympics down there and he came up to me and said, look, Every year, this is the highlight of my whole year. I live in redneck country out west in New South Wales. They all know that I'm the dopey. My kids are, you know, um, you know, marginalized and everything. But here, I feel like, you know, I'm with a tribe and the family and everything, and I'm just a normal person. So I have to go back and do it all for another 360 something days, and then I come back here. It's just my highlight of my life and everything. And I think it's just really, you know, uh, great to see how many people you know, stepped up, because that was a fear factor in the early days. As you said, you know, everyone had the head down and don't want to make any noise and blah, blah. We were all frightened that the cops just driving up and starting searching your place and finding your plans and the five kilos of Caroline and whatever. So in some way, everyone was just really, you know, and there was Bob then just really putting him out. And I think it was such a strike of genius when he did that uh, end, uh, prohibition end, that name because when they do they do the surname first so it's Wilson comma John said at the whatever rally in Baba so it was always and comma prohibition and it was just a genius stroke I must say and then jo uh, Bob walked to the police station with us protesting and that's on YouTube too and uh, you just google for Bob Hopkins at Nimmin police station or something and uh, handed himself in. He had to ask for the joint while we were all standing outside and he was just talking and then he knocked on the door and the cops were there on that time. And he said, and he had David Helpern right next to him who was at that time uh, lecturing at the university as well as being, as you said, the NIFA and Hemp Embassy uh, solicitor. And so he knocked on the door, the guy came out and no, 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 I'm smoking a joint yeah, yeah. <laughs> the policeman wasn't really attracted to the action because he saw all the other people out there. And in the end, uh, yeah, well, well, we might have to take you in then. And can I get my solicitor with me? Oh, is that necessary? Yes, it's necessary. And, so, and then Bob got actually uh, straight into a hunger strike in Grafton Jail because it was a Friday or Saturday. So he, till he would see the judge would have been Monday and he got straight into a hunger strike and gosh he was an energy at that time it was just unbelievable and then the judge made it that one of his conditions of his bail was that he wouldn't associate or smoke pot and Bob refused and so he went straight back inside so then we all organized this whole kind of rally for the next time he was in jail and or the next time he appeared in court and and yeah, I, yeah. That, so that all went off, and so there's another couple of hundred people around the Lismore Courthouse, all waving things. There's a wonderful photo of my 12-year-old <coughs> son sticking stickers on a police car in Prohibition. Um, but the <coughs> God love him. The, the, the judicial system had enough sense to actually change judges and get a guy in that wasn't a guy that eventually marched in one of the Mardi Gras rallies as the judge, and he just you know gave Bob a, jail, a get out of jail card free. And said, "Yeah, just behave yourself." And so he was like, we were able to get him out in time for the next Mardi Gras because that actual action to go in and and you know go to the cop shop that happened, I think, on April Fools. It, on the on the, the the YouTube, they haven't got the dates right. I mean, somebody wrote a rave somewhere on. Excuse me, this is a pedant historian kicking in. 
But I've got videos that are dated, so I can actually prove it, um, even though they're stuck in the back of a shipping container and probably don't play anymore, but still. That all happened in early April, and we had to get him out for Mardi Gras. And we did manage to get him out for Mardi Gras, and so that was, I think, the third, maybe, or the second? That was, would have been the third Mardi Gras. Which, and each year it got, it doubled in size for quite a few years, and it was really only, you know, it stayed, it got to a certain, you know, a sweet, you know, quite a large sweet spot, and then it stayed that way for a long, long, long time, really until the swab testing. And it, look, I mean, if you didn't live, actually in Nimbin and you're a regular pot smoker and you needed your licence, why would you come to Mardi Gras? You know, unless you've got a driver or, you know, it's, it's just really added a lot of complications. Um, as you say, this year there was a, a lack of police presence in town, which is great, but um, still all either side doing their thing. And, I mean, the weird irony, I mean, I, I got done that way a few years back and the, the irony is I was using this stuff with all the truckies swear by. So it probably works for amphetamines, doesn't work so well for pot. But, and I, I put, you know, I smoked a joint down here outside and I put all this shit in my mouth and drove up and they swabbed me and no problems, off you go. I went off, did the same thing yesterday, the next day and I came up positive. And it was like the only difference was that I didn't brush my teeth. Dirty hippie, you know. But the first day I had brushed my teeth and it worked. So I honestly think if anybody... Probably the most effective thing you can do for the swabs is to make sure you brush your fucking teeth in the top of your mouth and your tongue whenever you're going to drive. Brush your tongue. Brush the top of your mouth. Have a bottle of something to rinse your mouth out with. Keep doing that until you get to wherever you're going. But that's just my opinion. The, the, I mentioned that um, story in the Herald. I, I don't know if that was the... I, I remember that as being a defining moment because there was a year when they totally came with the riot squad. And, and yeah, and honestly, suddenly you know we've got these big black cars, public order and riot squad. They had four or six horses, horseback. They had a water cannon in Lismore in case they needed it. I don't know what they thought was going to happen, but that was that was a real moment, wasn't it? I I blame the real estate push myself. Um, Thomas, I should, probably shouldn't. I could probably get sued, but Thomas George, who was the local member for. National Party, and had pr serious real estate holdings, um, made a speech in Parliament where he said Nimbin was another Cronulla riot waiting to happen. Meanwhile, we had a new local area commander, Bluey Lyons, one of the ex-King's Cross copper, but ironically enough, one of the honest, one of the uncorrupted King's Cross coppers. That's pretty rare, but he was apparently, by all accounts, not one of the dodgy ones, but he became the area commander, and it seems like he wanted to make a name for himself by... Backing, Blue, uh, backing Thomas George. Perhaps they had a real estate deal cooking. I don't know. But he, at the same time, arced it up and backed up Thomas George. And it was when, when he... His first year, yeah, that's when they all arrived. And it was just like, for fuck's sake, guys, this is... Stoned hippies don't riot. You know, they party. They make a bit of noise. Some of the more aggressive ones will shout things at the coppers. But, you know, that's... No one's going to give you a, you know, like you talk about the Glasgow kisses, you know, where you headbutt somebody. We don't have a Nimbin kiss like that. <laughs> we probably should. I remember on the Sunday of that weekend, when we were all marching, quite a lot of the cops was hot. They took their jacket off. They just about were marching with us. It was like a joke for them, right, squad guys. The, the, other, the, other, um, the other totally defining moment has been the saliva testing. It just, it killed the crowd at Mardi Gras. And, and I can only say it to you guys, you're not allowed to tell anyone else, but it's solved our parking problem. Because as a fucking nightmare, Nimba, there is nowhere to park really and we'd have people park for miles and now the cops have got it back to a hand manageable size. Anyway, we should talk about the hemp embassy a little bit too because at the same time as Bob came up with the idea for Mardi Gras, he had this idea of creating a hemp embassy. And I've got the museum happening, which is now burnt down. So we made a room of that and Bob carved Nimbin Hemp Embassy. I think he'd even started it before then because we were doing fundraisers all the time, buddy trivia games, I remember, in the hall. Yeah. And he's registered this name. It's a great name. And then, you know, I can only tell it by the community. We, they built a new high school in Nimbin maybe 25 years ago now. And the community bought the old school, which is now the community centre. And, you know, they borrowed money and they... So 
where the Hemp Embassy is was the youth club and the neighbourhood centre. They all moved over to over to the old school. So it was our chance to stop doing fundraising and, you know, we rented the space, the Hemp Embassy. And another thing you can't tell anyone else is I just put a dealer in there on the street and so we didn't have to pay wages and we slowly built up stock. And that's, that's the Hemp Embassy's been there now, you know, more than 20 years. So it's been really our sole aim is to educate people. It seems that... You know, really we've been lied to big time on the whole drug war thing and the more we can educate people into thinking again or reviewing, you know, review prohibition, review the history of cannabis and prohibition, you can soon see, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary medicine. For, it can't kill you and it's handy for so much stuff, it seems, because of its anti-inflammatory properties. So it's big competition for big pharma, I think, and the police now... 50% of their work is drugs, possibly more, and it's enormous power they've got, and it's their jobs. They, they're not going to let it go. The police are the hardest people, I think, now to get to change the laws. They've become the experts. You know, people put up an idea to change the laws. D driving, for example, the police are totally stopping change happen. We can't have drug drivers on the road, and it's just, you know, ir become pretty irrational. But the Hemp Embassy, for years we were doing fundraisers. Remember Shebo? Town hall fundraisers that, you know. Bob, Bob was like driven. And I'm in, I, he woke me up to the drug war. I'd, I'd always loved pot, but when I came to Nimbin, it was really Bob who educated me. And the more I'm involved, the longer I've been involved, the more I realise the war on drugs is just massive. It's, it's a huge thing. It's a proper war, like we're saying about helicopter raids or, you know, the police, you know. We, we've got a lot more respect nowadays, but back then, 30 years ago, we were a joke. Just a bunch of scammers wanting to get stoned. It had no medicinal properties. It was. It's only when doctors have said, yeah, it's proper medicine that everyone started changing, I think. But it's been a long haul. Sheba, you'd remember um, trivia nights back in the day? Yeah. The hall was full. That was a good thing that we are here, you know, a lot of, uh, as you said before, you know, sympathetic and, uh, you know, supportive to the cause and everything. So we had really, you know, sold out the hall and made some funny nights there, trivia and fundraising and bribing and all these things and but here and but there. So in some way, yeah, it was amazing. Well, for me, uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking... We had uh, the first years of Mardi Gras were pretty horrible because... Uh, Friday night, I don't know if it's an Aussie habit or whatever, but it was just in front of the pub, beer or whatever, and joined. And then standing there, there was no selfies and there was no mobile phones, but, you know, just standing there and, oh, you know, and so in some way, it just, uh, there was so much drunken violence out there. It was so such a horror Friday night, you know, and we were thinking of, well, maybe have to reduce it back to Saturday, Sunday only and whatever. And then uh, we came up with the idea of uh, having an opening for the Mardi Gras to bring in that depth and saying, you know, this is not a party party festival and piss up as much as you want. This is a drug law reform festival and we should all just, you know, maybe uh, not have violence and all that shit. So then we started having the opening and, and we got the indigenous people to do the smoke ceremony and everything. And just to make a point there, minute of silence, you know, where I think that is a really good moment to really make everyone aware, look, you are lucky, you are here, that was before the saliva testing, and you can smoke here more or less openly, and uh, other people sit in jail for 20 years in Queensland for five kilos or something, and, you know, we are the lucky ones, and we should just in some way, you know, work on changing these things all over, and I must say... You know, Mardi Gras now, for me in the last, whatever, 10, 15 years, having these amazing talks, the Hemp Embassy has flown in people from all over the world, from Canada, America, and all these amazing people, and having amazing knowledge and bringing it out in Nimbin. It was just, you know, a talk fest, and you could have just sat there in the hall, and you would have been just, wow, man, there was so much information there from other people. I remember 96 as well, I think that was the first year we had the Hemp Olympics and the Combi Convoy and the opening 
And then uh, I was applying to go down to the Mardi Gras in Sydney, the gay and lesbian festival down there, and they have a huge parade after they've been beaten off the street, whatever, 45, 52 years ago. And uh, I thought, we bring the big joint, that's a big operation, the big bamboo joint, to build that together in one day and everything. And uh, bring out the message, good medicine was written on the joint and let it grow on the other side. For me, it came through seeing some program about, was it Sister Mary or somebody in San Francisco making cookies for the HIV positive community. And because these guys, they had to take 10, 12 different medications through the day. So they had these kind of chemicalized uh, osopharagus or something, and uh, they didn't feel like eating ever again or something. And then she came up with this, you know, the munchies, we all know about that. So she came up with making these cookies and handing them out more or less for free. And they started the club situation where you could get then some medicine after they moved a little bit on the law side. But just that kind of point was for me the point of going down there or wanting to go down with the ganja fairies. You know, what a bloody unbelievable creative stroke that was, having these women and, you know, how many are there now dancing up and down the street. So uh, I applied for it, and the guys in the management, they didn't get my point. The next year, they said, yes, we understand now. Sorry, yep, you're in, you're in. You are the hemp embassy and delegation. So we had the ganja ferries. We had the big joint, still made out of bamboo, on a higher truck on top of it. We had a smoke machine. We had loudspeakers for the ganja ferries dancing and being pushed to be quick because you have to go up Oxford Street Hill there and everything and there's some people you know timing you that you are really because everything has to have a flow not like the Nimbin Mardi Gras parade where everything can stop for a moment and Benny dance in the middle of the street or something or we have a crowning <laughs> you know so in some way yeah, it was amazing, and uh, the feedback was amazing too, I think, you know, by stepping out there and bringing the Ganja Ferry and the joints down to Sydney, I think that pushed us on another level, because we've been there, I remember you and your family with a little girl and boy, Jara and El uh, Elana and Louise and Bob going to the federal parliament and having a, a, a basket full of hemp uh, products just to bring over, hey, this is good stuff, you know, you can do all kinds of things with it. And I think, you know, gradually, you know, sl slowly, some people caught up with it. So we've done lots of sorties with the big joint to various things. There's a couple of good memories. You talked about Mark O'Brien before. So we've gone down to protest outside Parliament House, done that a few times. Did that for Obama, that was good. Anyway, we've gone down there and there's those car parks, you know, the big lawn in front of Parliament House. There's a couple of car, park, car parks on the side. So we've camped there, it's five in the morning, you know, it's freezing fucking cold. And, and we've got to build the big joint. This was the real days. We've all gone soft now with an inflatable joint. But back then we'd have to build this bamboo frame, you know. It'd take two hours, so we're there first thing in the morning, it's really cold. And um, I hear this, Mark O'Brien's with us, and I hear this crack on the footpath and I turn around and he's had a smoke of hash from Sam and totally passed out. And here he is, flat on his back on the bitumen, blood coming out from under his head and I think, fuck, I'm going to call an ambulance here, you know, at six in the morning. At the same time the gardener comes by and turns on the sprinkler, saying, so, oh, what an arsehole. <laughs> Yeah, that was a quite a memory. So we've had lots of those protests with the joint, especially the big one was the 99 drug summit in Sydney where I think it looked like it was all going to be about heroin and we wanted cannabis on the agenda. So we drove down there and camped in the park behind Parliament House and that was good. But for a long time the difficult thing for me, I'd have to say, has been... There's this image that pot smokers are all sort of useless stoners from Nimbin, but no one else was really talking about it much except maybe Alex Wodak occasionally. So do you talk about it or do you not talk about it because you, you want to change that image? And fortunately that has changed now, I reckon. It's become much more mainstream and Nimbin is not seen as wacky as it used to be. Yeah, it's, it's taken a long time. Meanwhile, we've kind of lost our grassroots a bit, I reckon. We don't go protesting like we used to, 
because I feel like it is on the agenda and I don't really want us to look like a bunch of wacky stoners. It hasn't helped. In some, remember the member for Coffs Harbour stood up in Parliament once when someone was proposing uh, changing the laws and he'd go, are you mad? You want everywhere to look like Nimbin? And everyone shut up. That was the end of it. The ironic part, and because like back in the day when it was first starting, there were other end marijuana prohibition organisations all around the country. And like I always found it ir just weirdly funny that the most organised, most together one was the Nimmin one. <laughs> that you'd meet the crew from, I'm not going to name any names, but from elsewhere and you'd go, fuck, these people are Fruit Loops. Could be projection, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's it's really it's fantastic that it's become a mainstream issue. It's great to have representatives in Parliament who are putting it much more to the front. What I personally worry about is the corporatisation of pot and of psychedelics, because that's happening as well, that basically it's sort of a hands-off model sort of at the moment until, they f until the corporations figure out how to grow and sell the stuff, at which point I suspect we're all going to get busted again. If we and, and one thing I think we really should keep lobbying for and pushing as much as possible is the right to grow your own. Because it's a fucking plant and, it, you know, it's, it grows itself virtually and it's a herb, it should be like parsley, you know, you should be able to just grow it in your backyard and supply yourself and your loved ones and it's all cool. And if we lose that then it's just going to wind up like, you know, 50 bucks a pack and, and that's sort of what appears to be happening in California at the moment. From I've got friends over there that have been long-term growers. A lot of them reckon it's harder to get to, you know, they're getting busted more often now that the corporations are in and you, to get a licence is virtually impossible. You need a lot of money. It's really strictly policed. There's all sorts of horror stories coming out about the sort of um, the mushroom clinics and the various things that are happening in California and overseas with seriously right-wing fundamentalist fuckers putting big money. I mean, Gina Reinhart's investing in these sort of things. That's one of the things we're really going to have to keep an eye on and do our best to keep it grassroots and the right to grow your own. Yeah, OK, you, you, we can buy them in a shop, but I'm going to grow my plants here because I like, you know, I like my wacky-backy. Yeah, that's a really big thing for me. I think you need to be able to grow your own weed. <clears throat> Absolutely, 100%. And, um, and I, I think that um, you need to be able to drive the car. Like, that's obviously the other big thing. And that's really what the... When we do our protesting, that's what we're really talking about. That's really what Mardi Gras is about now, for people to have access, to know where to go, who to talk to, etc. I mean, 2014 changed everything in the hemp embassy when the federal government said that, well, you know, we could use cannabis for people with epilepsy. And people just poured into Nimbin. That's when we really got a lot of people coming to the Medicans. You know, this whole place would be packed. There'd be another 200 people outside just to listen to information from real people who were telling their stories. And so that's like nine years ago it all changed, you know. Lucy Haslam, the whole story... And, um, and, you know, th probably a similar time when Facebook was really burgeoning and people were starting to connect more with other people on Facebook and groups. And so that was a great information exchange, even though it turned, you know, quite nasty in a lot of cases. But it was, you know, the intent of Facebook, I think, really brought people together to understand all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you mentioned Louise Haslam. She was uh, actually in some way... She created this thing, United in Compassion, and she had her first uh, festival, if you want to call it, uh, in Tamworth, where she is the local, and uh, she is the wife of a, a, a drug squad police officer who was working here in the hills and whatever, and their son, Dan, had actually bowel cancer, and so she ended up, because she's a clean skin and whatever, going to the New South Wales premier, that was the old rubbish uh, driver, whatever his name was, and uh, telling him about her son that with cannabis he can actually keep his food down and has a bit of an appetite, the munchies again, and just, you know, because he was more or less uh, dying of uh, starvation, and not that thing what I said before about HIV-positive people. And in some way, uh, because she was a copper woman and everything, respected, so they got an audience with the premier, and he actually flew into Tamworth, we were all there for the first, uh, United uh, in Compassion Congress, 
and uh, they were really modeling it quite a lot on the Mardi Gras, having all these people, some with Skype coming through, and just having these talk circles about the medicine. And Dan was still alive at that time, and that changed quite a lot and brought it into the mass media as well, because, you know, she was a respectable person in Tamworth. And in some way, you know, at the same time, we had the ice epi epidemic starting off, because I bought the paper in Tamworth on the Saturday, Sunday or something, and it had this big ice article uh, where, you know, it was just more in the rural areas and everything. For me, uh, you know, I think she, in the beginning, she couldn't believe you, Michael, you know, that we are running mad because they're not doing anything. And she had that feeling, well, I talked to the Premier, I got him flying in and opening it up. And so, you know, she had some really great steps achieved there. But overall, in the next six, eight years, she realized that we were right and, uh, you know, nothing is happening. Nobody wants to touch the item and nobody wants to be the party of having legalized cannabis. And then it all turns into, you know, New South Wales Nimbin. It's just all... So in some way, I remember a good one was when we had the joint down, we were doing the Hemp Olympics just before the real Olympics. Graham Dunstan's great moment there of uh, me announcing that uh, we should all do bong throwing at the, uh, at the real Olympics because there's more bongs than Jeffel line. Is it Jeffel? Yeah, yeah, and there's more bongs in Australian households than <laughs> Jeffelins, so we should all take a, take a page out of the Hemp Olympics and do the, have that as an official event and everything. So we had a week before, because Graham was thinking there's all these international uh, journalists around, and they finding their way around Sydney and give them something to do in between, you know. So we were the weekend before uh, the Olympics started in, uh, wow... Yeah, and we were there at the park uh, where the uni is and everything, and we were doing the Hemp Olympics. We had the big joint. We had Tony Spanners and his crew with the wild cars and everything. And then the big joint got onto The police was there with 20 horses on the side waiting for the riot to start or whatever. It was amazing. And then uh, the big joint came down for the next weekend when they had in uh, Melbourne the International Money Fund had a big meeting there, Gates was there, et cetera, et cetera. And some, was it Lebanese or some people got hand of the joint and they attacked the police over the barrier and everything. And then the police pulled the joint over and everything. Yeah, those were the good days and the wild times and everything. But uh, yeah, no, it's amazing how much it changed in the last 15 years, you know, since the medical acceptance in some way, and it's every day growing bigger and bigger. And as you said before, you know, we had here medical every three months. The Hemp Embassy was organizing a Medican uh, workshop, and you donated a bit of money or you paid something. And uh, we had all these people here coming from Queensland, Dr. Catalaris from Sydney, every time he was here, and uh, telling his story with a slideshow and everything. And just the amount of information, and then we filmed it and had it out on a YouTube channel, where I think there's still so much information out there. And they were the great days. And then... COVID came and uh, the cops were anyway here for Mardi Gras for years. I couldn't believe actually this Monday I heard from a friend that at 8 o'clock they were checking on Blue Knob Road, that's north coming into Nimbin. Yeah, after Mardi Gras, normally they're always there. We say, you know, they're coming on Thursday, Mardi Gras starts on Friday, and then they're staying and going in and out and coming back on Monday after Mardi Gras trying to catch all the clever people who leave after the festival and everything. And I remember running around in the cafes on Monday morning and telling people, you know, they are out there. Oh, you think so? Oh, you really think so? I said, mate, I know. I live here. You know, they are out there waiting for you. And they normally left around 4 o'clock on a Monday. Some year they were even on a Tuesday there. And I said, you just sit in the pub, look out of the window, and then you see the cop car going past, and then you can go up to Queensland and home. Sometimes it was that Queensland had a public holiday after our Mardi Gras. It was just in some way, was it Labor's Day? Yeah, and things like that, you know. But it's just, uh, yeah, it was amazing to see, you know, how little police was there and then how little people were there, honestly. You know, we had now the barricades pushed out into the street, so we have no parking cars there anymore, like in the early years. And it took you 10 minutes from the pub to the hall, easy, easy. Because, you know, there were dogs and kids and uh, prams and everything. 
and you know you just had to get to Michael and make an announcement or something you know and it was just unbelievable now we have all these broad wide pedestrian walks and it's just nobody there I couldn't believe it you know because normally as Michael was saying the parking problem and everyone thinks oh yeah no I come back and get one now or somebody's leaving and so they all just doing up and down the street there and everything and the big thing was when the showground joined in as well because that really gave another a uh, heavenly kind of uh, free area where I heard that police sometimes walked around there, but there's people now who come to Mardi Gras and you hardly ever see them up in town. They just come and buy another uh, carton of beer and then they sit down there near the fire and they meet with the guys from Victoria, from Queensland, and it's just their little thing now and they're coming to Mardi Gras meeting here. They might join in for the parade or something or the cabaret or something. But in the end, you know, they're just doing their own thing there. And in some way, that's really good, you know, and knowing that people are having the awareness now. And I think, you know, look, this is, you know, it's just the best festival in the world for me. Such a variety of, you know, fun things and uh, fringe things and everything, you know, and we had the art exhibitions and all that stuff, you know, which has died down a little. But just to smoke, not for two days before you drive to Mardi Gras, and then you know I catch up when I'm at Nimbin, that's for sure, and then you smoke a bit more, and then you hang, and then you leave maybe at 11 o'clock at night time. What is the big deal, you know? Where I feel like, is this one of these things where if, all, if we could organize one day where all the people who smoke are just being sympathetic to the cause and think it should be legalized, you know, all just come together on one weekend and do locally in their area, you know, but then it's always this thing, you don't want to really out yourself, it's just, you know, where that is still a very strong point, I think, for a lot of people, oh, he's a dopey or something, and I thought he was okay, or, you know. Well, and that's, that's also the thing with recreational and um, medical. medical. Like, it's just all a joke, it's just food, it's just medicine, it's just all those things. And to um, to say, oh well, I take medical weed, but I don't take recreational. Is like, uh, I don't even I don't even understand the concept because it is about relieving your pain and making you feel better, and we all want to feel better, and it's not hurting anyone. So, I've got to tell you um, a memory of that. So we've gone down. This is the week before the Olympics in Sydney. And is it Hyde Park? We Hyde Park, we go and we build the joint, you know, and Tony Spanos is there. And he's brought a Volkswagen. And we're not allowed... There's a, there's a parade for all these international journalists. And we thought we're going to take the joint, but we weren't allowed to have cars, remember? So we thought we'll pull a Volkswagen with a hemp rope. So he gets these steel posts out of the garden in the national the park and puts them in the windows so the joint sits in the middle... So we're towing this Volkswagen and Chicken George is sitting on top of it in his plantum suit and this police horse is guarding us all the way and, you know, the cops couldn't really do anything because there's journos everywhere. The bad bit was going back. Do you remember going back? Anyway, I lose control of the whole thing on the way back and everyone's paranoid the cops are going to get us now. So they bolt down a side street with this Volkswagen with steel posts coming out the windows which just took out a whole stream of cars all the way. I still feel bad about it down that laneway. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add something to the very important point that, that Carolyn made about um, medical versus recreational. I mean, Ken Kesey, the great activist, um, revolutionary psychedelic warrior, really, from the 60s in America, used to have this whole rave about high pride. Now, back when being gay or being being not normal was really shunned, the gays had a whole thing about gay pride. Be proud of the fact that you're gay. Well, his Keezy's rave was high pride. I like getting high. There's nothing fucking wrong with it. And I think we need to sort of push that line a bit more. That like it, it, it's it's a all humans use drugs. We always have. It just you know it just depends which flavour you happen to like. Some people fuck it right up no matter what the drug is, you know. Some people use too much. People always have problems with everything. That's, that's humans. It's not the drug's fault. Um, but cannabis is such a essentially benign drug for many people. Not for everyone. Some people should never smoke it because they, they have a predisposition that doesn't work with cannabis. But for the vast majority of people, you know, if, if I'd have drunk as much as I've smoked, I'd be a fucking mess. 
if I'd have used cocaine or amphetamines or heroin or any of the other drugs as much as I've used cannabis, I'd be a mess. I have used tobacco as much or more than I've used cannabis and I'm a mess, you know. Smoking's not good for you but cannabis is a pretty benign... If you, want a, if you want a happy crowd for partying, for just being happy in life, it's a really benign drug. And I think we need to push the angle that, no, I'm not sick, I just like getting high. Yeah, and, and a lot of the power of cannabis, I think, that's made it so threatening medicinally is it does make you feel good. You know, not only takes your pain away, it can make you feel good. It doesn't turn you into an idiot like a lot of um, antidepressants will do. They'll dumb you down a bit. So we, we have a reputation now as the mental health party, and we are a bit, and it's quite difficult. We haven't talked about the political thing much. So the, the hemp party was really sustained by the hemp embassy for ages, you know. And now, you know, in the last few years we changed our name to legalised cannabis, which was smart, I reckon. And it's on the agenda because of the driving rules especially and people having to pay lots of money for legal weed when we could grow it ourselves. But for me, I can tell you guys, I, I was talking to Jeremy this morning, so the guy we've elected as the Member of Parliament in New South Wales is a proper stoner. All the other people that have been elected, are, you know, Dr Brian over in Western Australia, he knows medical cannabis well and other people might talk a bit, but Jeremy is grown up as a stoner and he knows the culture well and he's all for two big things. He's fixed the driving laws. He wants to get rid of the industrial hemp rules. He reckons there's no THC in it, get rid of all the rules on it, it's bullshit. And we are really keen to try to create some kind of cottage industry to, to be, be in the supply chain rather than big pharma. And that's going to be a real challenge, but I think worth, you know, really worth thinking about. Thousands of people, I reckon, would have jobs there, would love to have jobs growing boutique weed or a certain amount, like small breweries. It doesn't have to be giant breweries. It can be little ones. So I hope that's something we're going to aim for. That's definitely a grassroots kind of angle on the whole weed thing is bringing it back to community <coughs> where we can all, you know, help each other to uh, have a market, make a little bit of money, make it legal. You mean the Greens actually uh, released their weed policy in Nimbin <laughs> a few months ago, which was pretty funny. And um, and basically they're, they're basically following that same thing where they're saying, well, we should be able to grow our own but also that there needs to be cottage industry um, kind of exceptions. So there's, there's rules like if you've got any kind of criminal record, you know, you can't be involved in the industry, you can't work in the, the big, you know, multinational kind of factories that are springing up around all the major city airports in Australia. And, um, and so... You know, and they're wearing hazmat suits, and they're growing. We actually, we've we've had legal weed for a few years, and um, I don't really like it. I find it really too strong. And the last batch that we got, I found made me sweaty. You know, so I would just much rather smoke outdoor weed, and we know what it is, and it's sunshine, it's been grown in the ground, and it hasn't been sprayed with anything, and there's no you know chemical business, and that's the kind of weed that Nimbin is really famous for. People come here and they want bush weed. And, it's, and people all around Australia grow bush weed, let's be honest. And so to have a little cottage industry here where we had some kind of market where it was moderated, where it was tested, you know, we get a licence to grow 20 kilos a year and that's what we try and provide. And you get one for 50 because you've got more family that can help you grow it and it gets tested and we've dealt, you know, we've agreed on a price because it's a cooperative just like the fruit and veg type of thing, and then it's available, it's packaged, it's marketed, people can come to Nimbin, whatever. But it's local trade, it's a grassroots kind of business, it's just like anything um, that supports community, makes employment, brings in small amounts of money, it, and, and nobody can grab it. Because that's how the health food industry really started. Because I have been, you know, I've always been fussy about food. So the health food industry started. All these great small family grassroots um, businesses started 
And then as they got bigger and better known and got their supply chains going, the big people came in and just ate them up. And so then all of this kind of community, grassroots stuff that gets started, then gets turned into a conglomerate, and then that conglomerate might get eaten up by a Woolworths chain. Or, and so it just keeps on... It's, it's all going up to the top all the time instead of staying down here where we all live. Yeah, just on the point there of growing yourself, you know, I think uh, it is such an important moment if you grow your own pot, you have a real relationship to your plants. I don't know how much you sit in front of a dope plant, but, you know, my admiration and just the smell and da-da-da, you know, it's just a really, you know, you connecting to your smoke in the future in some way. And we had this story in Germany where there were, uh, in the 90s, there were some three young people and uh, they found that they had a lot of high uh, uh, lead in content in their blood. They had an amazing amount of lead in there. And they were in a hospital and uh, the doctor was talking to them and they didn't want to come over with the truth and everything. In the end, they said, yeah, we smoke a bit of weed and everything. So the doctor said, ah, oh, can you bring me some? They had the same dealer, all different three. Can you bring me maybe a little bit of a sample and everything? So that came through and uh, they analyzed it. And the truth is that it was sprayed with uh, fine metal grains or something just to make it heavier. So then you just make more money out of one butt, which is seven grams, and then he weighs maybe eight and a half, nine, and you get more money. At the same time, you're inhaling this stuff. As well as I learned uh, when we had the bigger times, uh, earlier days, you know, that there's something you can get uh, the plants switched on by using some poison and everything. And the first year, you should not use it the harvest of that but then you know people are uh, pressured traumatized whatever and greedy that's the one probably in the end and just give a fuck about that and just gonna sell that stuff because hey don't worry about that or you know and you're just putting it out there so that's where i feel like for me that point of connecting to my own future harvest is really important and that kind of symbiotic uh, relationship we develop then is really you know part of uh, making me feel better, high, and everything. Where, you know, you never know how it was grown, if it's under light, and they tell you, oh, no, this is bush butt, and da, 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 you know? But the truth is, I think it is really an important step in bringing people back into the garden as well, you know? And then you live maybe in the second floor of a, of a rental house or something, and, uh, you know, you have nowhere to grow and everything, you know, where I feel like, you know, we really need to change that, that you can grow them on the balcony, you know, without having fear because the neighbor is seeing it and stuff. I had so many people getting busted because they were just thinking, oh, yeah, I'm pretty safe and nobody can see it. And then, and it's just the whole stigma around it. It's just so unbelievable, you know, how many people are really getting fucked over and their life destroyed. Where I must say, you know, we have young couples here with a baby and they're moving into the hills and step out of Brisbane or the Gold Coast area. And he's still working over there as a cook or dish, uh, uh, you know, doing dishes or something. But he brings in the legal dollar and he's having to drive and everything. Then he gets uh, tested. He loses his license, so the next thing, you know, there's pressure in the relationship because the money is not coming in. They can't uh, do whatever mortgage payments or just survive on that little bit of money you get. And so in some way, I think it's just a little bit of a system of filling our jails up as well, while we have now the latest, biggest, uh, you know, here in Grafton build again. And just, you know, trying to push people into, you know, it's just unbelievable, you know, how many people's lives just got only, you know, as you said, with your case, you know, uh, that, you know, it just turns your life around and makes it hell from then on. And you've always been in the uh, computer of the policeman, you know, oh, you had some uh, issue there with cannabis. Oh, we better search the car and everything. The entry for them to, you know, harass you and uh, diminish you in some way. And I remember in Sydney the time, it must have been the 90s, when they were doing the sniffer dogs on the trains there, and all they got was a gram here or three or five there, as if any big dealer, and I have nothing against dealer to clear that up, but, you know, would be in the train and driving around with the trains and knowing that there's sniffer dogs maybe in Redfern or whatever station, you know, they weren't really in the posh parts of Sydney. And it's just really, you know, in some way something to, you know, as we had the helicopter built by Graham Dunstan, the war against drugs is a war against the people, you know. I thought that was... Yeah pretty much on the point.
all the legal weed is really grown indoors. I don't think there's anything, virtually nothing grown outdoors. And I doubt if any of it's organic also. But back on the hemp embassy, you know, uh, uh, talking about this, I'm aware that we, we've tailed off a lot of our, you know, insistent, provocative campaigning, I think, because the word is out there now, really, and hopefully people are doing it. But I do feel strongly about trying to create a cottage industry rather than letting big pharma get hold of it. I was saying to Neil before, it's actually the same as the opium poppy. Like, a couple of hundred years ago, all the medicines would have had cannabis and the opium poppy in them. They're the two really good pain relievers. So no one tries to grow their own poppies much anymore. But more than half the, the global legal supply is grown in Tasmania every year. And we buy it back in little pills. And now the same's happening with weed, really. The big companies can grow it legally. We buy it back in a packet from a doctor, through via a doctor, you know. So they've really got their foot on our neck. And it's, this, it's the big one for me to try to keep happening now, that people can, not only we can grow our own, but people can have a small business, you know. There's, there's a lot of young people who would love to actually earn a living growing weed, I reckon. And it's a valuable, you know, way. It's a, it's a career, put it that way. There's a lot of young people that love, do love growing cannabis for a career and yeah. why should they lose their job? Yeah, exactly. Or their or skills. Yeah. Like the knowledge around here alone on the northern rivers of how to grow cannabis in a particularly difficult climate to grow it in is fantastic, you know, and that's something I want to try and, you know, Jeremy gets that, we'll try and embrace that in, in any changes we make. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's masterclass stuff around here, completely. And, um, and you see that when, you know, we've all been to Vancouver and you've been to the West Coast since it all happened and, you know, it's just a whole different way of thinking, isn't it? Just completely different. And, you know, I, I went to Vancouver in, like, 1985 was the first time. I just start, started smoking weed then. And uh, it was so wonderful to have a real freedom of weed in Vancouver. And that was all because the state um, premier of BC was cool, you know. So it's just – it's a political thing. You, you realise in Canberra you're allowed to grow two plants – Lots of lots of points there that have come up, but we should honour also Bob Marsh, the first policeman here in. He he was the one who sent a letter to the uh, Progress Association saying, "I don't think there'll be any problem with holding a festival here." Uh, he handled the that whole festival and a few of those so. And brilliantly, and then for that performance, he was then rewarded by the police department by being sent to Dubbo or somewhere else, and then a couple of other spots until he finally retired from the police force and came back home to run a bus, school bus, and also to sell this building to a cooperative that I started. The bush, the bush cop, the bush cop, here, and that was Bob Marsh saying, it's cool, that'll be okay, be able to take care of that. And he was then, luckily, after he got pushed out and kicked out, was likely followed by Adrian. And in fact, Adrian, of course, became famous uh, from Beth Cannon, seeing uh, a, a little, a little warning, uh, a, a, a touch of shoulder, a warning, a gentle warning from Adrian in one of the songs. These, these kind of things remind me of you. Uh, but what I wanted to also especially mention, because I'm uh, uh, closer, I can, I thought I could speak better. Is that better? Sorry about that. Uh, 
I also want to mention how we got out on tunnel Halls and, and, and got through that raid. It was the first big raid. And uh, we firstly had warning from Doug McPherson because he was here in town playing tennis with all the locals. And they said, oh, I think there's going to be a lot of police out at Tunnable tomorrow. And when he came back, he went to the tin shed and somehow very soon there was a car uh, across the bridge, across the creek. And that meant that a lot of police the next morning had to get a lot of exercise and do a lot of walking across to anywhere. And, uh, and it also meant that by the time they, they got anywhere, because Frank Reed, young Frank Reed, did a huge run every, in every direction, he, they finally found one ounce of grass on Tunnel Falls. One ounce. Uh, so that we could joke that this was, the cost of the raid was the most expensive one ounce in Australia. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the person with the contact that you mentioned was Sonia Atkinson and one of her previous liaisons perhaps or just friends happened to be the ex-Attorney General of Australia, Kep Enby. Uh, and he had, the Whitman government had just been kicked out. Luckily the Neville Rand government took over in New South Wales. And Kep Enby retired from politics and went back to the law. And then Sonia Atkinson, through a past friendship, uh, rang him up and asked if he could help. So he then immediately placed a uh, uh, some application to the Supreme Court of New South Wales. And uh, I went down there to represent the, the co-op. Uh, and Neville Rand appointed the most incredibly weird barrister, like from Charles Dickens, who in front of the, at the Supreme Court, when he was speaking to the, to the judge, he'd rub his hands together and bend over and say, well, my lord, and Kev Enby just stood up straight and said, well, I think da, 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 and spoke to him as uh, more, at least an equal. Now, we won the, we, we didn't win anything at that court, but Kev Enby and the judge, and the judge said, well, I can't actually give a direct order here. What you're saying is they went with one search warrant to look through a hundred houses. One search warrant for a hundred houses, not appropriate, but I can't give a direct order. And Kev said, well, I'm sure, Your Lordship, that if you, Worship, uh, if you actually just made an opinion about that, the local magistrate in Lismore may listen. And so, one case came up, Sue Utley, Sue Bingham, Sue Utley came up at the local magistrate's court and the magistrate also heard the opinion of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and said, I don't think this uh, search warrant was valid. And the police then dropped all the other cases. Now, I only mention all of that because Oh, sorry, again, okay. Um, he's a bit rude, isn't he? Is that something I should be? No. Uh, so, I'm just mentioning that because we have to use all of those extra little contacts, be they the former Attorney General of Australia or anything else, because it's a soft change process. It's always taking the soft version because it is, there's nothing aggressive about it. It's a soft change 
and all of those pieces come together like that. And that was our history here. Uh, David Helliwell did a wonderful job in terms of the local, yep. but we had a previous doctor, Kingsley Pearson, yeah, we did. who was, who claimed that there was no difference between opium and heroin. It was a drug, every drug was a drug that had to be gotten rid of. Uh, or controlled by doctors. That was a reasonable other step, if it's all under the control of doctors. And well, doc doctors do not recognise the difference between hydro and bush. And that's part of our problem at the moment. I think that one part of anything that can really work will finally be a anti-hydro movement. You. Actually using anti-hydro as a label and explaining, let us be the people warning straights. Don't use hydro, don't, hydro is not good for you. <laughs> so anti-hydro label might actually be helpful in, uh, because otherwise it's about money as, as Harry Freeman was saying, and copyright of drugs being redone and a copyright again and a copyright again and all of these hydro companies are trying to create a copyright on their particular hydro mix. But I've talked too long uh, and uh, I'll handle it back. Yeah, just on the point there, maybe just on the point there for people who weren't around here, but uh, David, Dr. David Halliwell, he actually went to Holland and uh, visited uh, cannabis cafes and he had a two-page article in the Northern Star in the mid-90s, I would say, uh, which was supportive to our cause and everything, and just saying, you know, it's a civilized society there, it's working, and the people can go into their coffee shop, and they have the one store there where you have the Afghani, whatever, all kinds of different varieties from hash to grass, and then right next to it, five meters away, there's a big munchy uh, table, which is three times bigger than the dope table. And uh, they have all kinds of chocolate, like uh, all kinds of sweet shit. So you first buy your thing there, then you walk past there, you get your cup of tea, and then you sit down and you don't move for three and a half, four hours. But it is really amazing, you know, uh, what he, by having that article for all our normal rednecks, this is really redneck country here, and I think it's just changed so much more in the last 20 years, that's 50 years Aquarius, so in some way, you know, it took a long time, and even in the pub, and then when, you know, you had the rednecks here, and the hippies over there drinking maybe a beer or two, it's really, you know, amazing, and I was over in uh, Amsterdam, they do the High Times uh, Cannabis Cup over there every year, where uh, the biggest growers in America, they get some, some, some slaves flying in their dope. And then uh, they had in that year when we were there, they have a passport and you have whatever, 10, 12 different uh, cafes all uh, involved. And you go in there and you smoke their stuff because then these American growers providing this special variety in this cafe for the whole week of the Cannabis Cup. And then you get a stamp that you were there and that you tested it and later on you can vote and everything. But uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, we were actually doing hemp TV in Hamburg. I was so lucky that uh, some people uh, lent me a camera and uh, I was filming a few of our Mardi Gras, early Mardi Gras, this was the Ganja Fairies and the Combi Convoy and the Hemp Olympics and Bronx Row and Iron Growers person event and joint rolling. Wow, did the German love the joint rolling? So we had some TV stations. I was involved with uh, TV Hamburg. That was on a, a called the Open Channel, which was when you had cable TV, then you could get the Open Channel. I don't know the logic in that one because nobody had the money for cable. And in Berlin, they had Sativa Vision. That was their name of their show and their program. And we had on blue screen right behind me while the two guys were doing the show and interviewing me. And we had the kind of fairies dancing there, the comedy convoys coming in, the joint rolling and everything. You know, it was just an amazing time by having that kind of technology. It was all on a VHS tape in the end, you know. I got it over and then, you know, we popped it in. But just, you know, the help of that in some way, where if I think back, you know, we had in Berlin the hash rebels in the 60s, early 60s. And they were a bit more militant, they were non, uh, not uh, 
not these kind of pussy footy uh, hippies like we are. That, that's right, that's where they come. Grew into uh, the movement of the 2nd of June, which was the day when a policeman killed a student in Germany in an anti Shah demonstration. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, it was just, uh, now I lost the track, and I mean, smoke for a day or two. It's a problem for those people not smoking. One of the great side effects of um, Mardi Gras has been the, the showground in Nimbin. So we had, we had this Sergeant Neville Plush who quit the police while he was here. He kind of woke up to the drug war and he became the secretary of the showground and opened the gates and they had quietly made a fortune and d developed great, you know, they're not for profit, the same as the head embassy is. They're a not-for-profit incorporated association. So the terrific facilities down there have really been financed by Money Gross. We shall remain for a couple of minutes. Any questions? A question? How is that? I enjoyed judging the Nibbin Cup for three years. Say it again. I enjoyed judging the Hep The Cannabis Cup. For three years. Every venue was a surprise. Yeah. It was just absolutely one of the milestones of my smoking career. Good on you, the Cannabis Cup was um, yeah. Mardi Gras for years, yeah. until one year the police tried really hard to raid it, and fortunately they broke into the wrong place. Oh. It was actually happening in town, and they smashed into the wrong place, and we thought, well, it was getting difficult, so now it's actually held a month or so later, in oh. June sometime. Brilliant. As being new to this community, but having seen it myself from a business perspective, a lot of the community initiatives that you've come up with have really kept it together. I'm wondering, um, the people that initiated those and the liaisons with the police, did the police welcome these community initiatives or did they find it challenging to their authority because you were able to maintain the authority the order they were. Was there head when that came in, the initiatives? I'll tell you what, there was lots of head with the local community. We didn't really talk about that. There was a lot of opposition to Mardi Gras in the beginning, and the thing that changed it was businesses making lots of money, I think. Okay. You know, the businesses had a really good weekend. But look, police negotiations, how was it, Neil? You made some great movies of the police. <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was more of that, yeah, wasn't it? police press for really or harassing. Um, I, I think it, it changes every few years because they keep moving them around. I mean, like one, one, one year it might be a very sympathetic person, you know, with them, or at least apparently sympathetic. The next year it's a really angry man. Um, cops, like I, as I said before, I think there's been a change of the guards. Traditionally, there was a, you know, people talk about the culture wars that were left over from the 60s, the us versus them thing, which, which is still real enough. A lot of that's died down. The old blokes are all retired or dead. Same here, you know. Uh, the younger guys don't have that same I hate hippies routine happening, so they're much what they come. And it's like we talked before about when the, um, the riot squad came. Now, when they first arrived, they, you know, they're riot squad. Fuck, they're trained to be, they're like SAS guys, they're hard men. And you watch them mellow over the weekend. And by the end of it, yeah, they've got their jackets on, and they think, gee, some of those servants are all right. <laughs> And, you know, it's pretty horrible, but for the shills. But uh, I think it's pretty obvious to any cop with even a partially open mind that this is the problem. That, you know, if I were rights for a cop, what am I doing here? And I think the same must, I haven't had any negotiations. My negotiations with the cops have always been fairly confrontational, I have to say. Um, except once when Roger Rogers tried to recruit me, and I was just like, fuck, I'm out of here. <laughs> but, um, but Michael's probably dealt with it more than I have in any kind of official capacity, but it really depends on the cop you're dealing with. And, and one year it might be a really good, good cop up. There is such a thing. And, and as Terry said before, the, the first few, first 10 years or whatever in Minden, the cops were great. They did a tap on the shoulder. Oh, look, you know, he, this guy is a bit funny. The Vietnam vet? Sorry? The Vietnam vet cop. The Vietnam vet, well, he got, you know. You know I mean, a lot of them had breakdowns and left. You know, some got converted to sort of fundamentalist Christianity. One poor bastard had Dennis Walker take his gun off him. This is an Aboriginal activist holding him on the ground in the back of the rainbow and sort of 
systematically let off the bullets in the air and then point at him, how do you like it? Bam! How do you like it? I mean, he left yeah. pretty soon. I mean, that wasn't nice. I don't know if it was. I wouldn't say he was ruling the police by any stretch, but, you know, De Dennis has, you know, he's, well, he's an original guy. He's been fucked up by the police his whole life and seen his whole life. So there's always going to be this weird thing going down between any undercast mob and us if he's our own undercast, any way we like it. Um, and the police, they're, they're there to protect property, really, and to uphold the law, whatever that means. What but, about the dogs, the police dogs? Well, well that's, that's what got me going. Oh, so when they first arrived, they couldn't walk down the street. But well, they, they first started raiding places because that's why I had a camera. I'd given up tobacco that week, so I was pretty fucking antsy. <laughs> and I decided, well, fuck this. What are you kidding? I love Let's see how they react to a, to a camera in their face. And I followed them around for a few years. And that, you know, they, they behaved really well when the camera was wrong. But I mean, everyone's got phones now. Uh,